Now it's time for the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening, Lawrence. Good evening, Alex. And you know, uh, just to be sure, I don't forget anything important in a show like, say, I don't know, the name of the guest who's mm -hmm. sitting right in front of me. I have one of these little cards. Uh, you might be able to read this one. Mm -hmm. uh, it says Hillary Rodham Clinton. I don't think I need this one tonight. I think. You think the face is enough to just remember? I think I can remember her name. I think you got it. And, uh, and full disclosure, Alex, uh, I am, of course, very excited, very nervous uh, to have uh, Secretary Clinton here. And I had the honor of working with her when she was First Lady and I was working in the Senate uh, a number of years ago. I won't say how many. Uh, and so um, <laughs> there, there's a... Uh, it's a reunion. I, let's just say I, I lean heavily uh, in her favor. And well, so, um, I'm just going to say, Lawrence, at some reunions, you do need name tags. Mm -hmm. But yeah, at this reunion, this not the this bonds one. are strong enough, the mm -hmm. recognition is strong enough that you're just going to go yep. by face alone, and the memories will come flooding back. Yep. And it is great to have her here. It is. I will be watching. Thanks, have a Alex. great show. Thanks. Well, the most important thing to know about Brett Bayer is that he is a member of the club, being a member of a club, any club, offers certain privileges and certain protections. Brett Bayer is a member of that Washington club that fancies itself to be the unbiased news media of Washington. Club members always include people who work at the major newspapers that we all rely on, major magazines, the news divisions of the broadcast networks. And to prove they are unbiased, they believe they must include in their club at least one anchor from Fox, and that's Brett Bayer. But the truth is, Brett Bayer is not so secretly a hardcore supporter of Donald Trump. He's as much a supporter of Donald Trump as anyone else working at Fox. When the objective election analysts at Fox called the state of Arizona for Joe Biden on election night, the supposedly unbiased Brett Baer privately urged the network to lie about Arizona. He privately urged the network to reverse its call in Arizona, which proved to be true when all the other networks called Arizona for Joe Biden four days later. The Fox election analysts did a brilliant independent job in the last election, and they were the first to accurately call Arizona. And all of the primetime hosts at Fox panicked and have all been caught in emails and texts with each other and the, and the network demanding that Fox lie about who won Arizona. Brett Baer was one of those people. Brett Baer and all of the primetime hosts at Fox were as angry about Fox calling Arizona for Joe Biden as Donald Trump was. There was absolutely no difference between Donald Trump's reaction to Fox calling Arizona for Biden and Brett Baer's then secret reaction to Fox calling Arizona for Joe Biden. All of this came out in the Dominion lawsuit, successfully suing Fox for lying about Dominion voting machines. What Brett Baer did while the votes were being counted in the last presidential election did not get him kicked out of the club. And so other members of the club who work elsewhere for fair news organizations will maybe have no problem with Brett Bayer interrupting Vice President Kamala Harris tonight more than he has ever interrupted any presidential candidate in an interview. They will have no problem with Brett Bayer showing a Trump campaign commercial in the middle of the interview and asking the vice president to respond to a Trump campaign commercial instead of a question that he might be able to think up himself. Brett Bayer was functioning as a Trump campaign operative in that interview by literally playing a Trump commercial in the middle of it, using the precious minutes of an interview with a presidential candidate to run the opponent's commercial, a Trump commercial. And Brett Bayer himself personally lied. Brett Bayer lied deliberately and knowingly about what Donald Trump has said he wants to do to the Americans he calls the enemy within, which includes everyone watching this program right now. It includes our first guest. It includes everyone working in this building. As Donald Trump has defined it so far, it includes every one of the 81 million people who voted for Joe Biden and will probably vote for Kamala Harris. That's the enemy within, according to Donald Trump. And Brett Bayer lied about that. When he showed a clip of Donald Trump 
he chose to show not the video of what Donald Trump actually said, but he showed instead, knowingly and corruptly, a ridiculous tape of Donald Trump on the Fox network earlier today, claiming that he was never threatening anyone and laughing about it. And Brett Bayer took that to be a fact, that Donald Trump never threatened anyone. That is the kind of Trump campaign operative junk that Brett Bayer sullied himself with, with and was throwing into his interview with the vice president tonight and the vice president very forcefully responded. Why, if he's as bad as you say, that half of this country is now supporting this person who could be the 47th president of the United States? Why is that happening? This is an election for president of the United States. It's not supposed to be easy. I know, but it's not it's supposed as... to be. It, 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 it is not supposed to be a so cakewalk for So are they misguided, the 50 percent? Are they me, stupid? What, oh, what God, is it? I would never say that about the American people. And in fact, if you listen to Donald Trump, if you watch any of his rallies, he's the one who tends to demean and belittle and diminish the American people. He's the one who talks about an enemy within, within an enemy within, talking about the American people suggesting he would turn the American military on the American people. We asked that the, question to the former president today. Harris Faulkner had a, a town hall, and this is how he responded. I heard about that. They, they were saying I was, like, threatening. I'm not threatening anybody. They're the ones doing the threatening. They do phony investigations. I've been investigated more than Alphonse Capone. He was the greatest oh gangster. No, it's All true. Right. We've no, but think of it. It's called weaponization of government. It's a terrible thing. So, Brett, I, I'm sorry, and with all due respect, that clip was not what he has been saying about the enemy within that he has repeated when he's speaking about the American people. That's not what you just showed. Well, he was asked no, about that no, specific... No, 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 that's not what you just showed, in all no, fairness no, no, no. and I'm respect you to you. I'm telling you that was the question that we asked him. Uh, you didn't show that, and here's the bottom line. He has repeated it many times, and you and I both know that. And you and I both know that he has talked about turning the American military on the American people. He has talked about going after people who are engaged in peaceful protest. He has talked about locking people up because they disagree agree with him. This is a democracy. And in, in a democracy, the President of the United States, in the United States of America, should be willing to be able to handle criticism without saying he'd lock people up for doing it. And this is what is at stake, which is why you have someone like the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff saying what Mark Milley has said about Donald Trump being a threat to the United States of America. And here is what Donald Trump actually said about the enemy within that Brett Bayer would absolutely not allow his audience to hear tonight. The bigger problem is the enemy from within, not even the people that have come in and destroying our country, by the way, totally destroying our country, the towns, the villages, they're being inundated. But I don't think they're the problem in terms of election day. I think the bigger problem are the people from within. We have some very bad people. We have some sick people, radical left lunatics. And I think they're the big, and, and it should be very easily handled by, if necessary, by National Guard, or if really necessary, by the military, uh, they, because they can't let that happen. That is the video that Brett Bayer should have shown. Now, to put Brett Bayer's Trump supporting fanaticism in perspective, consider this. When Brett Bayer was angrily and repeatedly and secretly telling people at Fox four years ago that they had to immediately begin publicly lying about Arizona and reverse the Fox election desk's call for Joe Biden in Arizona, there was not a single person at any other network, including this one, asking anyone to change an election call in any state. Not in the history of television news has anyone ever asked the election desk at any network to change the call on a state to favor another candidate. The only people in the history of television who've ever done that are Brett Bayer and the Fox primetime anchors. No one else, never.
But Brett Bayer is still a member of the club, a member of the Washington club, and I most definitely am not, because I will tell you the truth about Brett Bayer and about other members of the club, and the club does not allow that. Your campaign slogan is a new way forward, and it's time to turn the page. You've been vice president for three and a half years, so what are you turning the page from? Well, first of all, turning the page from the last decade in which we have been burdened with the kind of rhetoric coming from Donald Trump that has been designed and implemented to divide our country and have Americans literally point fingers at each other. Rhetoric and an approach to leadership that suggests that the strength of a leader is based on who you beat down instead of what we all know. The strength of leadership is based on who you lift up. You, the strength of an Vice American president. president, which is one who understands that the vast majority of us have more in common than what separates us. Madam that Vice is President, more than 70 percent of people That is tell about pollsters. turning the page on rhetoric that people are frankly exhausted. Three weeks from now, Brett Bayer will not be running down the halls of Fox demanding that the election desk, desk change their call of any state, because Fox has fired the people who did that. They fired the people who told the truth and kept the liars, the Trump-supporting liars. The new Fox election desk will not dare do anything to anger Brett Bayer or Donald Trump or Fox's primetime anchors. Never again. That's the lesson Fox learned about telling the truth on election night. Never again. Vice President Harris went to Washington, crossing Historic Park in Pennsylvania today, where, during the Revolutionary War, George Washington crossed the Delaware River. The vice president was accompanied by prominent Republicans, including Adam Kinzinger, who have never voted for a Democratic president before. Here on Christmas night, 1776, General George Washington and over 2,000 troops crossed the icy Delaware River in darkness, then marched to Trenton where they surprised an outpost of enemy soldiers and achieved a major victory in the American Revolution. And after we won the war and achieved our independence, delegates from across the nation gathered not far from here in Philadelphia to write and to sign the Constitution of the United States. The founders often disagreed, often quite passionately. But in the end, the Constitution of the United States laid out the foundations of our democracy, including the rule of law, that there would be checks and balances, that we would have free and fair elections, and a peaceful transfer of power. So I am joined today by over 100 Republican leaders from across Pennsylvania and across our country who are supporting my candidacy for President of the United States. And I am deeply honored to have their support. Some served in state houses, some in the United States Congress, some worked for other Republican presidents and presidential nominees, including Mitt Romney, John McCain, George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush, and Ronald Reagan. And some today served in Donald Trump's own administration. We also have with us Republican voters from here in Pennsylvania and beyond who have been active in their Republican parties for years, who have supported Republican candidates up and down the ticket. Now, I say all that to make an obvious point. In a typical election year, <laughs> you all being here with me <laughs> might be a bit surprising, dare I say unusual. 
but not in this election. Not in this election. Because at stake in this race are the democratic ideals that our founders and generations of Americans before us have fought for. At stake in this election is the Constitution of the United States, it very self. We are here today because we share a core belief that we must put country before party. He has stated that one of the biggest threats America faces is, quote, the enemy from within. The, the enemy from within. But know where that language harkens back to. Understand and let us be clear about what he is saying. He considers any American who doesn't support him or bend to his will to be an enemy to our country. And further, he says that as commander in chief, he would use our military to go after them. Honestly, let that sink in. Use of the American military to go after American citizens? And we know who he would target first because he has targeted them and attacked them before. Journalists whose stories he doesn't like. Nonpartisan election officials who refuse to cheat by finding extra votes for him. Judges who insist on following the law instead of following him. It is clear Donald Trump is increasingly unstable and unhinged. Yeah. Leading off our discussion tonight is former First Lady, former Secretary of State, former United States Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton. Her new book, which is a New York Times bestseller, is titled Something Lost, Something Gained, Reflections on Life, Love, and Liberty. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. We have known each other a very long time. It's your first time on this program, and I'm nervous about that. Oh, uh, dear. You, you know, at first I thought when, when they <laughs> said, you know, when it's I thought, oh, yeah, I've known her forever. This will be fine. <laughs> um, uh, what we just heard today right. in two places, one on Fox, right. which was a, a stunning thing to watch, but then also in Pennsylvania, two versions of this candidate. Uh, in complete control of her message and what she wants to deliver in Pennsylvania, and then uh, fighting back misinformation on Fox. What are you seeing in this candidacy as you watch it at this stage? What I'm seeing is a person who has the character, the values, the temperament, the discipline to be an absolutely first-class president. And that's what I want the American people to see as well, Lawrence. You know, you gave these two examples. Her speech uh, in Pennsylvania, right on the point where George Washington crossed the Delaware, and she reminded us of that uh, heroic fight for our liberty. Um, she covered all of the important points about the danger that someone who doesn't believe in our Constitution, doesn't believe in the rule of law, doesn't believe in the kind of fundamental values that we hold dear in our country, and that Washington crossed that Delaware in order to uh, wage a revolution and achieve. And then on Fox, she stood up for herself. She didn't take any of the sort of foxiness uh, mm -hmm. rhetoric that came from uh, Bear. And she was able to make her points despite every effort to undermine her and talk over her. She's exactly the kind of person that I want to be president. You know, uh, we had a minute to talk privately. Uh, I know you well enough to know you're really enthusiastic about her. Now, here's what else I know. No matter who the Democratic nominee would be, you'd be sitting here. Yes. And, and you'd be pushing yes. that nominee. And you have done it for every Democratic nominee that you can help, and you always will. But you're really personally enthusiastic. I about am her. so excited about um, her candidacy. I've known her a long time. 
Uh, her sister actually worked for me in the 2016 mm -hmm. uh, campaign, so I know the family. Um, I w did everything I could to help her as vice president. You know, vice president is a tough position for anybody. Here she was, our first woman vice president, coming in during COVID, for heaven's sakes. It was such a complicated time. And I know how well prepared she is and most importantly, how profoundly she loves and wants to serve this country. And so when the change came and, and President Biden made that really selfless, patriotic decision mm -hmm. to step down and endorsed her, I immediately uh, followed suit and endorsed her. And I think she's run a nearly flawless campaign. Uh, she was thrown into the deep end and she had a great convention. Uh, she wiped the floor with Trump in the debate. I could not be more excited. The New York Times account of that day is, you're on Martha's Vineyard. Mm -hmm. By the way, I was on Martha's Vineyard, too, and I had to rush back, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you're on Martha's Vineyard, and uh, your husband gets a phone call from the vice president mm -hmm. of the United States. Uh, shortly after that, you get a phone call from the vice president of the United States. It's not a package deal with her. These are two different individuals who she wants to speak to. Um, you both decided faster than anyone uh, to to endorse her. What was that decision about? It was about a couple of things. First of all, it followed Joe Biden's endorsement. Yes. And I thought she had earned it. I thought that she and only she had been on the ticket with him during the primary season. I knew that all the work that had been done um, in the Biden campaign to raise money would not go to anyone else mm -hmm. but her because she had been uh, the running mate. And I also knew that some of the, you know, the wishful thinking and the speculating about let's have some sort of, you know, primary where people go on Lawrence's show and mm -hmm. everybody watches them or something like that made absolutely no sense, that we didn't have the time and it would not be um, in any way uh, effective, and it would not help us win. So for reasons having to do with her and the fact that I thought she was eminently qualified, the process, the rules, and let's get to the convention and get off to uh, the fall campaign, I, I didn't have a single doubt about endorsing her. It's so reassuring for me to hear that from someone so wise about all of this process, because that was exactly my position, as I was saying. Like the, you, This is a fantasy out there that you can go out and suddenly rush some kind of primary that would be decided at a convention. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, anybody who had any future ambitions, and we have a yeah. great bench of Democrats, yes, yes wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Right, and they didn't. And they didn't. Right. Yeah. Um, as we go forward in this campaign, uh, do you think there is a closing issue, a single issue that is that should be top of this campaign or is top of the campaign? I, I think that the vice president has kind of pivoted toward uh, the closing argument, and the closing argument has two parts. The closing argument is what kind of country do we want to be? What kind of people are we? Do we want to be divided? Do we want to be, you know, set into um, arguments with each other that we can't ever agree on solving our problems? And she is qualified to bring our country together, and he is not. He is increasingly uh, evidencing, as he did at that bizarre 39-minute on the stage bopping to mm -hmm. the songs that apparently he plays at Mar-a-Lago, he is unqualified to be president. He's unqualified by temperament. He's unqualified by behavior. He's unqualified by experience. He's unqualified by his agenda, the Project 2025 agenda. And so I think she's converging those two arguments. And really, that is the argument. I mean, people have to ask themselves, look, I may not agree with her. It's the kind of Liz Cheney argument. I may not agree with her on issues. But boy, do I agree with her that our democracy is at stake. Mm -hmm. I want to protect our freedom and our rights and the rule of law and everything we hold dear. She's our only choice. And guess what? Besides, he is increasingly unstable and unhinged. We have seen evidence of that. But now it's every day, Lawrence. Mm -hmm. It's every day. And he's increasingly threatening and dangerous. You know, you were 100% right in your opening to point out he has threatened yeah. to put the American military in our streets, not only to deport people he thinks should be deported, but 
the rest of us who don't agree yeah. with him, who have a different view about what is the best uh, interests of America. So I think it's a positive argument for her, but more importantly, for our country, for our democracy, for our freedom. And it's a reminder of how dangerous he is. We're going to squeeze in a commercial break. Uh, we're going to come back. We're going to talk a little bit about, about your book, which is uh, Something Lost, Something Gained. This is a personal book. This is a warm book. It's a relaxed version of you. <laughs> it's, it's not a secretary of state trying to teach you uh, dense <laughs> lessons. Uh, we're going to be right back with former secretary of state Hillary Clinton. Amber Thurman's family have come out on a press call, and they're doing what's called a pre-buttle to our town hall right now. Oh, that's nice. Yeah? And I want to get... get better ratings, I promise. Amber Thurman is dead. She died because she couldn't get the medical care she needed after Donald Trump got Roe versus Wade overturned. Her son was six years old when she died. He will never know what it's like to bring his elementary school report cards home to his mother. He will never know what it's like to have his mother at his graduations, but he already knows what it's like to be made fun of by Donald Trump on national television. My daughter Amber made me so proud. She was having complications. And Tonight, we are learning more about the death of Amber Thurman. The death of Amber Thurman was likely preventable if she'd had access to abortion care in her home state of Georgia. What happened to her was preventable. My daughter is gone because of what Donald Trump did. For 54 years, they were trying to get Roe v. Wade terminated, and I did it, and I'm proud to have done it. It's nothing good enough to bring her back. Her life is over. I've never been a political person, never. I'm voting for Kamala Harris because she showed me she really cared. I felt her sincerity, and I felt her strength. We will speak her name, Amber Nicole Thurman. I felt her compassion. We will never get Amber back, but we can make sure this never happens again. I'm Kamala Harris, and I approve this message. Still with us, Madam Secretary Hillary Clinton, uh, this has become, as we knew it would, such a grim subject since Roe was overturned, something that you watched a 50-year battle on uh, finally turn in this direction, and here we are. And we know um, that Amber and one other woman in Georgia are verified deaths. We know that tens of thousands of women in those states that have intimidated and threatened doctors uh, in ways that make them reluctant to provide the medical care, that women who face um, complications, life-threatening complications in their pregnancy need, uh, we know that thousands of women who have been raped are forced to carry their rapist child. Um, yes, we now are seeing the worst nightmares uh, that people understood could happen, and they are happening in half the country. And, you know, as I write in my book, uh, Lawrence, this is obviously about women's reproductive rights. It's about abortion. It's about the overturning of Roe v. Wade. But it's about democracy. Mm -hmm. It's about you know, cruelty. Mm -hmm. It's about um, men in positions of power who are either indifferent, insensitive, or actually, as we heard uh, from Trump, uh, contemptuous of the real pain and suffering that women are experiencing. I want to go to your book on this. Uh, and normally I read passages from the book, but we have your audio book, and I think we can just take it from that. In 2009, Dr. George Tiller, an abortion provider whose clinic was bombed in 1986 and who survived an assassination attempt in 1993, was shot dead while serving as an usher at his Wichita church by an anti-abortion extremist. And Donald Trump, who promised to appoint Supreme Court justices who would overturn Roe, had won the state by 15 points over Joe Biden in 2020. So there were plenty of reasons to expect Kansas voters would embrace an amendment to end abortion rights in their state. 
But after Roe was overturned, the ground seemed to shift. Unexpectedly strong support for abortion rights from independent voters led to a landslide victory of 59 to 41 percent. Fourteen counties that went for Trump in 2020, as well as all five that went for Biden, voted against the amendment and for reproductive freedom. Abortion rights were safe in Kansas for now. For now. For now, right? Well, in fact, every state that has had abortion on the ballot has voted in favor of providing uh, abortion as reproductive health care for the women of that state. There is no doubt in my mind, however, that if uh, the worst were to happen and Donald Trump were to become uh, president again, uh, he would go along with and sign a national abortion ban. If we were to keep the Congress, which of course I hope we will, keeping the Senate, taking back the House, uh, he would use other techniques. Uh, he would look at that Project 2025 agenda. He would listen to um, his very extreme supporters, uh, whether it would be using the FDA to try to uh, undermine the use of medication abortion, whether it would be going along with states who want to literally prevent women from traveling out of state to get the health care they need. Um, my daughter and I, uh, co-produced a movie called Zorowski versus Texas that looks at three women uh, who were very much uh, affected by the abortion ban in Texas and all of the shenanigans and the tricks that are played by the government uh, of Texas to try to uh, prevent them from getting the care they need. That would be, um, I am absolutely confident, the next step that uh, would be taken under Trump. Uh how would you explain, how would you describe the stakes in this presidential election? Look, I, I you know, I am not a kind of overly um, extreme person, as you know, but and I... And I want to <laughs> certify that. That's absolutely true. But I think the stakes could not be higher. I think that the stakes truly are uh, the future of our democracy, our freedom and our rights. You know, uh, Justice Elena Kagan gave a speech here in New York about three weeks ago in which she said, you know, take my colleagues seriously uh, because they're, if given a chance, going to go after gay marriage. They'll go after the right to contraception. The Repu one of the Republican senators from Indiana said on a, uh, a show, a TV show just a week or so ago, he thinks interracial marriage should be reconsidered. They would love to dismantle the uh, progress that has been made in expanding opportunity and rights to all Americans to take back the privilege, uh, the domination uh, that they think they're entitled to. And so I think this is democracy versus autocracy. It's uh, freedom versus oppression. It's the survival of our institutions. And so people who are still undecided, I hope, uh, vote for a future where you can continue to argue about policies mm -hmm. and about politics, yeah. right? I would love to have a tax discussion on this program yes. with a Republican candidate. You'd be great of, at yeah. that, I uh, know. So no one knows better than you do uh, the life, the day-to-day -day life of Kamala Harris right mm. now. A woman presidential mm -hmm. candidate, she's sitting on top of all of that campaign apparatus. There are so many advisors, and then there's all sorts of geniuses out there on TV and elsewhere, elsewhere telling her what to do. Right. Here's what she's got to do tomorrow. And you're sitting up there. You're the candidate. You're hearing things. That you're hearing comments like, "Oh, they have to do more uh, to get black men. They have to do more to get white women. They have to get this demographic." You've been there. You've right. heard that. Mm -hmm. You've been trying to fly that plane to a destination mm -hmm. point with all of that incoming stuff. How do you do it? How does she do it? She is doing exactly what she should and must do. She is staying focused on the North Star, winning this election and literally saving our country. And I, and I really believe that, which means that she is taking risks. I mean, going on Fox, um, going on podcasts, you know, literally going and, and being willing to talk about the important uh, stakes in this election uh, every chance she can in front of audiences who, you know, are not always paying attention to mm -hmm. political uh, news coverage. 
She is demonstrating the kind of steel in her spine that we need in a president. You know, it's still hard for some people to imagine a woman in the Oval Office. Mm -hmm. So you have to walk that line between, you know, being the truly compassionate, caring person I know her to be, but also being the disciplined, strong person a president must be. Mm -hmm. I, I think she is doing exactly what she needs to do and and being ready for whatever October surprise, you know, is thrown her way, whatever AI does uh, mm -hmm. to try to, you know, act uh, up in a way that causes questions about her, be prepared to answer that. Um, but I think she has to stay on the path that she's on now, go everywhere around the country that she can to make her case and do as much uh, media that actually makes a difference to voters who are still undecided or wavering or not sure of uh, how they're going to vote. When she came into the vice presidency, you, better than anyone, knew what she was mm -hmm. in for. Mm -hmm. uh, you came into that White House. You were put under a microscope unlike any previous first lady in history and then especially attacked because you wanted to do something. Yeah. You wanted to actually help. You wanted to see if we could get somewhere on health care. And then they really came after you. <laughs> yes. Vice President Harris comes into the vice presidency and they start coming after her in articles, somehow criticizing her for not doing the job, whatever that is, by mm -hmm. the way, of the vice presidency. Mm -hmm. I don't remember a single article about Dan Quayle not doing a good job right. as vice president. Right. I mean, everybody who knows anything about American history knows that the vice president is part of the president's team. Mm -hmm. And and that's what she saw as being her mission to support Joe Biden in the middle of COVID. You know, think about it. They go into the White House. It's hard enough a job uh, at any point in time, but they're in a pandemic. There's just been an insurrection uh, against uh, the legitimate winner, Joe Biden, of the election. And they are juggling a million different things. And they're standing there with masks on because they're trying to model responsible leadership in the midst of a pandemic. She's running up to the Hill all the time to <laughs> cast the deciding vote mm -hmm. uh, in the Senate. I mean, it was a strange even bizarre. You had time. some advice for her? Oh, I had a lot of advice and support and talked with her, met with her, uh, introduced her to people that I thought would be uh, helpful to her um, because I was really in her corner and mm -hmm. I knew um, the quality of her leadership. But I also knew being vice president is a tough road mm -hmm. to hoe. Um, and I thought that, um, you know, she really grew into the job. She was underestimated um, at every turn. She remained 100 percent loyal to the president, not a single, you know, leak of anything other than I'm on the team and I'm doing the best I can. And it turned out that um, she was well prepared when the time came for her to be our nominee. Well, I know what it's like to have Hillary in your <laughs> corner, and she is very, very lucky uh, to have that. The new book is Something Lost, Something Gained. This is a very special book. This is Grandmother Hillary. Oh, this is the yeah. softer focused. Uh, th this is not something that's trying to turn you into the next Secretary of State. Uh, you own Hillary. I know many of you people out there already own some Hillary Clinton books. This is perfect. This is the great one. This will be here for Christmas shopping season. This is the one to get. Thank you so much Thank for joining you. us tonight. I could go on and on. You know that. Yeah, I've loved talking to you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. We'll be right back with Neil Katyal and his new article, which is titled, In Case of an Election Crisis, This is What You Need to Know. Neil Katyal joins us next. In case of an election crisis, this is what you need to know. That is the headline of Neil Katyal's new op-ed piece in The New York Times discussing how the Trump team's attack on the election results will be different this time. In 2024, writes Neil Katyal, quote, the judicial branch may be unable to save our democracy. The rogues are no longer amateurs. They have spent the last four years going pro meticulously devising a strategy across multiple fronts, state legislatures, Congress, executive branches, and elected judges to overturn any close election. Joining us now is Neil Katyal, former acting U.S. Solicitor General, who has argued over 50 cases before the United States Supreme Court. He's a professor at Georgetown Law and host of the podcast Courtside with Neil Katyal. Neil, how will it be different this time? 
Well, Lawrence, when I bumped into you in the airport, of all places, I said to you that I think I've written the most important op-ed I've ever written, and I believe that because what I did was I spent some weeks trying to understand election law and all the different pressure points, and then I married it up with the statements that Donald Trump and his minions have, make, have been making, things like J.D. Vance saying in the vice presidential debate he couldn't even admit that Donald Trump lost in 2020. And all that together leads me to think that they have a very concerted, deep strategy to try and take the election away from the American voters should the election on November 5th not turn out the way that, um, uh, that they hope it will. So this is their backup plan. And it's a very dangerous one because, as that quote you just showed, is there's multiple fora, state legislatures, state governors, local election boards, state courts, federal courts, and the U.S. Congress, and they only need to prevail in any one of those. Yeah, and you make the point that uh, there's 1,200 federal judges. You just need one uh, in the right spot uh, to get in the way of this election. Absolutely. So, you know, one judge could do it, and it also could be that a simple majority in the House or Senate on January, House and Senate on January 6th could lead vote elector votes to be disqualified or a slate of electors by a state to be thrown out. And you could have a circumstance in which the House and Senate warrants are literally picking the next president and not the United States people. And, you know, for most of our lifetimes, there was a consensus Republicans and Democrats understood, like, the crown jewel of America was our right to vote. Like, when I argue the Voting Rights Act case, it had just been reauthorized in the House 421 votes to three and 98 to zero in the Senate. And now there's nothing like that. People on the Republican Party are perfectly feel, feel very comfortable disenfranchising people, throwing out their votes. Um, and, you know, anyone who thinks the opposite has been purged from the Republican Party. Now, uh, there was a reform of the Electoral College Act, the, the, the law that controls the, the processing of the Electoral College votes by Congress that most people thought improved that process. Yeah, and I completely agree that in two, 2022, they passed the Electoral Count Reform Act, which makes it harder to throw out state slates of electors and makes it, you know, the limited number of, they limit the number of objections that members of Congress could make. And it can't just be one member of Congress or something like that. It requires at least 20 percent of the House and Senate to bring an issue to the floor of Congress on January 6th. But 20 percent of the Republican Party sure seems willing to entertain crackpot theories, Lawrence. And my concern is, if in November we vote for a Congress in the House and Senate that is Republican-controlled, even if Kamala Harris wins the vote, they can act in Congress on January 6th to disqualify states or disqualify people in the Electoral College and swing the presidency to Donald Trump. And, you know, in 2020, this wasn't as big of a fear, not even though we didn't have the, the 22 Act, it wasn't as much of a fear because Biden overwhelmingly won the Electoral College, 306 votes to 232. And what that meant practically was that Trump had to run the table and flip a bunch of states. He couldn't just flip one and win the election and take it away from the American people. He had to win money, many. But now the polling suggests it might be down to a single state. It could be mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, it could be Arizona, who knows? And in that circumstance, Trump is going to do everything in his power to try and swing that election for himself, even if it means taking the vote away from the American people. That's what I think all Americans need to be worried about right now and why we need to hear responsible Republicans like George W. Bush and others come forward and say, this is not the America we know. Neil Katyal, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, a very special West Wing last word. NBC's four-time Emmy-winning series, The West Wing, has sometimes been critiqued for idealizing the presidency as portrayed by the brilliant and beloved Martin Sheen and romanticizing the work and motivations of a White House staff, not allowing a single cynic or political hack to work among them. In the fictional series, The West Wing, which was recently honored at the White House on the 25th anniversary of the first episode of the show, we 
the writers of the show, led by Aaron Sorkin and John Wells, were usually steering the characters to do the right thing. But in the episodes that I wrote, I always made sure that they'd tried to do the easy political thing first before trying the right thing as a last resort. Bob Woodward's new instant best-selling book titled War is full of President Biden and Vice President Harris and the West Wing staff trying to do the right thing as a first choice. It's a story, says Bob Woodward, of steady and purposeful leadership. It is a story of a president and a White House staff not just doing the work that we want them to do, but being the kind of people we want them to be. 51-year-old Brett McGirt, the National Security Coordinator for the Middle East, has, among other duties, spent every day of his life since October 7th, 2023, trying to get hostages held by Hamas released. On page 303 of Bob Woodward's book, there is a scene involving Brett McGirt that grabs your heart in a way that nothing we ever wrote on the West Wing ever could. On April 24th, President Biden hosted Abigail Eden, a four-year-old girl who was held hostage by Hamas for 50 days. Hamas militants had entered her family's home on October 7th and shot and killed her mother and father in front of her. Her older siblings, aged six and 10, had locked themselves inside a cupboard upstairs and hid for 14 hours. Abigail's father had been shot while, Abigail, while shielding Abigail, who crawled out from under his body and went to a neighbor's house. Later that day, Hamas took her hostage with that family of five. Now, Abigail crawled around the resolute desk, playing with her sister and brother in the Oval Office. <clears throat> the three children were now living with their aunt and uncle in Tel Aviv. Biden gave the family a tour. Out on the White House lawn, Brett McGurk was pushing four-year-old Abigail on a swing. 